Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy uh, uh, Study Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you here this afternoon for this briefing entitled Complete Streets, Improving Safety and Choices for All. And indeed, that is exactly what this briefing is going to focus on. We are very glad to have as, as partners in this Smart Growth America and their project of the National Complete Streets Coalition uh, to talk about this important issue and the fact that there are now 500 entities across the country, the local, state, regional level that have embraced the whole notion of complete streets and how we be do a better job in terms of thinking about all of the users of our streets and to make things better in terms of choices, safety, and how this really is manifested in different ways, depending upon whether you are a small community, a large city, rural versus urban or suburban, everything has its own look. But again, the whole purpose is to make things better in terms of options and safer for all users. To open our briefing this afternoon, we are absolutely delighted to have with us Congresswoman Doris Matsui from California. And she has been in, in such an important leader, and, and we're going to hear more from her with regard to legislation that she has just introduced. But the Congresswoman has represented the city of Sacramento and its surrounding areas since, 19, or since 2005, where she has been committed to strengthening Sacramento's flood protection, and we all know how important that has been, ensuring the quality and affordable health care for all. She's worked aggressively to promote a clean energy economy so that indeed her area can be a vibrant region where families can live, work, and play and truly be a land of opportunity. She has been a very passionate advocate with regard to increasing public transportation options in Sacramento and I would say also nationally. She has been engaged in the planning and execution of an intermodal transportation center in downtown Sacramento and was also highly instrumental in securing the necessary funds to extend Sacramento's light rail system. She serves on the House Energy and Commerce Committee, which holds jurisdiction over issues that impact all of us every single day in terms of thinking about energy, health care, technology, consumer protection, environmental quality, and the list goes on. She is co-chair of the Bipartisan Congressional High-Tech Caucus. She's vice chair of the Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition. And she is also chairing a task force on seniors, a very important constituency as well that we're going to hear more about today. So it is my pleasure to introduce Congresswoman Matsui. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. And, um, it's a delight to be here today. Thank you very much for being here. I love to be here with um, advocates like yourself because you're the soldiers on the ground and you understand um, what your neighborhoods are like. And you want to ensure that there is safety in your neighborhoods and be able to have everyone use it and not just um, have it overloaded with cars. As we know that the highway system was built uh, in the 50s and 60s where cars were dominant and we are changing our lifestyle and uh, we have to also change um, our roads and uh, the, ways, the way we get along. So I'm thrilled to be joining this impressive group of uh, all of you transportation stakeholders this afternoon and uh, I'd like to thank EESI, the National Complete Streets Coalition and Smart Growth America for hosting this briefing and thank you to this panel of very distinguished uh, speakers for being with us today and thank you for contributing all that you do um, and also how we're going to be discussing how we move forward. Several years ago I became an advocate for National Complete Streets Policy for the same reason that everyone else has, safety. And um, safety for pedestrians, safety for bikers, safety for the disabled, safety for transit riders, safety for the elderly. Safety for children walking to school. Safety for all users of our streets. And like many other cities across the country, my home district of Sacramento continues to bear witness to too many preventable accidents involving pedestrians. Just last year, uh, Michelle, who was 16 years old, a high school student, 
was struck and killed as she was crossing a busy street. And she, what she was doing is crossing the street to volunteer at a local elementary school in Sacramento. And here in D.C., every single day, we hear a, on the traffic, morning traffic reports, about a pedestrian or a bike rider that has been struck. And this is absolutely unacceptable, but un, you know, unfortunately unsurprising. Too many of the roads in our country are designed solely with drivers in mind and making them unsafe to the thousands of Americans who choose alternate forms of transportation. Now, we all know we're moving towards alternate forms of transportation, so we do have to change. But these needless and avoidable accidents are vivid reminders of why we need complete streets policies. We all know that there are best practices to make our streets safer. But without turning that knowledge into action, we are unnecessarily putting many at risk. This year, the Complete Streets Coalition passed a huge milestone. And Carol mentioned that. When the 500th jurisdiction throughout the United States adopted Complete Streets policies, cities and states have been leading the way, and it is far past time for the federal government to step up and show that it too is committed to improving the safety of our communities. And that is why I'm excited to once again introduce, and we're going to call it the Safe Streets Act. This bipartisan legislation introduced by Representative Joyce and myself is our response to show we are serious about advancing responsible transportation policies. The Safe Streets Act gives states two years to adopt comprehensive complete streets policies for transportation projects. It will ensure that future transportation investments are designed, planned, and constructed with all the needs of the users in mind, regardless of their age, mobility, or mode of travel. Shortly, you're going to be hearing from our panel of experts about the many benefits provided by complete streets policies, safety, environmental, economic, public health, the list goes on and on. And the cost of inaction, as we all know, is great and unfortunately often tragic. I remain steadfast in my commitment to advancing these goals and look forward to working with all of you, a greater number of all of you, uh, on the shared vision of making our communities more livable, sustainable, and most importantly, safe. This is our time. I think when you look back even five years ago, I don't think you saw as many walkers or bikers around. And many cities, including D.C., are really thinking very creatively about how we might make these changes so that people could actually, you know, not only use bikes, for instance, for recreational activities, but as you know, as I know, a lot of people ride their bikes to work. And we're encouraging that. Because, you know, unfortunately, we have here a certain number of cars, as you know, and we're not going to build any more, really. We can't widen the roads anymore here. So with allowing the streets to be able to be used by all in a safe manner is going to move us forward. And I look forward to the day that every street that we see is complete and safe. So thank you very much, and I look forward to working with you as we move forward. Thank you. We have received a charge, and I think that we are so fortunate to have that kind of leadership here in the Congress. Um, to really provide a vision to work in such an important bipartisan way so that everybody can help understand the stakes that we all have in this important issue. And as she was speaking, I also was um, and mentioned uh, how often we see tragedy com connected with our streets, and it just made me think of what happened just a few blocks from here yesterday uh, with regard to the horrific um, uh, accident over by Union Station uh, in terms of of many people being injured you know the where the street clearly was uh, not not safe and um, uh, and we saw a lot of of injury as a as a result of of a terrible accident um, 
At this time, I would like to turn briefly to uh, Jeff Anderson, who is the president and CEO of Smart Growth America. Uh, and Smart Growth America is, is a partner for this particular briefing. And it is wonderful to have Jeff here. He is very well known for his leadership in sustainable community planning and development. Before he came to Smart Growth America as its president and CEO, he served as the leader of the Smart Growth Program at US EPA for eight years. He's been a leader in the Smart Growth Movement and an author of the 10 Smart Growth Principles that have been a foundation for smart growth across the country uh, that have been used by many uh, officials across the country as well as advocates. And he has provided very hands-on assistance to a number of local, um, uh, local jurisdictions. Jeff? Hi, Camille. Welcome. Thanks for coming uh, this afternoon. We really appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to EESI for uh, jointly hosting this along with us. We're pleased to be in partnership with you, so appreciate that. Um, and I definitely want to thank Representatives Matsui and Joyce for their leadership on this issue, and in particular, Representatives' longstanding leadership. She's been very stalwart with her support and concern for these issues. Smart Growth America, for those who don't know, we're a national nonprofit organization. Uh, we are concerned with creating great communities, uh, with uh, getting jobs and transportation and uh, housing near shops and schools and other daily amenities that people need. Uh, we think these build economically vibrant communities, uh, help, budget, help fiscal uh, budgets be kept in line at the local level, and create great livable places. And obviously what we're here to talk about today is complete streets and safety. Um, and some of you may know the, the story of Raquel Nelson um, uh, about a little over a year ago down in Atlanta. Uh, a mother with a couple of kids was getting off a bus on an arterial in Atlanta and got let off on the side of the street and she could walk a half mile with kids in one direction to the, to the intersection or a long way in the other direction to the other intersection and she did what I wager anyone in this room would do, which is cross where she was because the other side of the street was where her house was. And uh, in the process of that crossing, uh, one of her kids got away from her and got killed. Um, and, you know, which is incredibly tragic, obviously. There were charges filed in the case, uh, vehicular manslaughter. They were charged against Raquel Nelson, uh, the mother who lost her kid, um, because she had apparently not used the street correctly in crossing to get to her house. Um, so that was clearly a situation where the design of the street, the design of the community, the placement of the transit stop all conspired to create a, a very unsafe situation. It's not uncommon, uh, you know, situation around the country. Uh, we tend to focus on the impact it has on uh, pedestrians, on bicycl uh, bicyclists. But, you know, if I'm the driver of that car, uh, that's a horrible experience. Um, and, in fact, we also know from looking at places where complete streets have been implemented around the country, it makes the roads safer for the drivers makes the roads safer for the auto users as well. Uh, so this is really about all users on the streets and making great places where we can feel like we can, you know, take kids in our car, take kids across streets, take kids on bikes, let them go on bikes, God forbid, without us. Uh, because that's what a bunch of us used to do. Uh, and we'd like to have our kids have that autonomy and not have to, have to drag them around everywhere and use our time that way. So... Uh, this is a critical issue. It's a critical quality of life issue. It's a critical issue for safety. Uh, and I'm just very thrilled to be uh, the place where the Complete Streets Coalition comes together in Smart Growth America and to be able to work with all of the terrific partners, many of which are here uh, this afternoon. And in particular, thrilled to just have a small part on this panel uh, and hear from some of our uh, partners at the local level who are really advancing this issue so assiduously. So thank you. And talking about partners who are advancing uh, these issues and dealing with very complex situations at the local level, we will turn to our next speaker, who is Danny Pleasant, who is the Transportation Director for the City of Charlotte. So everybody should listen up because just remember that the, the Transportation Secretary-designate is Danny's mayor. Uh -huh. um, and so... Uh, we might get some good clues. Uh, but I think, let me 
tell you just a little bit about the, what all Danny's been dealing with in terms of his capacity at Charlotte, because we all know that Charlotte has just been growing. It's a burgeoning um, uh, city in the southeast. There is so much um, uh, new economic growth, population growth, et cetera. And so, as I said, he is the director of Charlotte's Transportation Department. And so he's in that capacity, as you would presume, he is responsible for road and transportation planning and operations, including the policy development necessary as well and as um, neighborhood traffic projects. He has to oversee capital project prioritization. We all know how difficult that can be. His department is responsible for 2,100 miles of streets and traffic signals at more than 630 intersections. The department provides planning services for the Mecklenburg Union Metropolitan Planning Organization and recently developed a transportation action plan to deal with the expected, with the expected growth over the course of the next 25 years. Danny came to the city of Charlotte in 2002 after he had served as a transportation planning bureau chief for the city of Orlando for 14 years, another small challenge, right? Uh, and he'd also been a transportation planner in Atlanta, Georgia, Chapel Hill, and Fayetteville, North Carolina. So we are very, very fortunate to have Danny with us this afternoon to talk to us about how this is being addressed at the local level and some of the things that we should be really thinking about with regard to complete streets. <clears throat> Thank you, Carol. It's not often I get to raise the mic. <laughs> uh, so I appreciate that. Uh, You're welcome. <laughs> uh, so as Carol said, I, I uh, am proud to serve the city of Charlotte as its transportation director. And the, uh, Charlotte is, uh, in case you don't know, it's, it's the largest city in North Carolina. It is um, located about halfway between uh, Washington, D.C. and Atlanta along I-85 and I-77. I uh, hope you'll come to see us. Charlotte is uh, currently the 17th largest city in the country. You probably didn't realize we were that large of a city as far as an incorporated city is concerned. Our metropolitan area is probably in the 30 range, something like that as far as large cities. The Census Bureau declared us the uh, fastest growing urban area in the country between 2010 and 2012. And um, I don't know if we can keep that pace, but it certainly is interesting that we're, we're growing that fast uh, right after uh, one of the worst recessions we've ever had. But Charlotte is a, is a sprawling Sunbelt city. It has, it's, most of its growth occurred since the 1950s. It occurred in the, in the heyday of the automobile. Uh, lots of roads and highways were built, uh, sprawling development patterns, separated uses, all the things that you see in these kinds of cities. And so as we prepare our city for the challenges of the future, we, keep, we, we remain very mindful that we are in a changing uh, demographic and a changing market preference era. And for Charlotte to compete, and we like to compete, we like to attract business and industry into our city, we like our quality of life, and we like to put ourselves up against any city in the country for all that. And we have that civic pride, and I hope your city has the same civic pride that we do. Um, so in uh, around 2000, we started, and, and actually in the 1990s, we started looking deeply at what our city needed to be as it develops over time. And we, we planned around something called a centers, cor centers quarters, and wedges uh, framework so that we could create those lifestyle choices uh, throughout our city and integrate our transportation system with those lifestyle choices, which includes creating lots of transportation choices as well. And as we thought about this, we, we went out and we polled our citizenry, and we continue to poll them about every two years, and we've been doing that for about 12 or 15 years or so. And we find that when asked the question, do you believe that streets should be available for all users virtually, they, it, we get an overwhelming yes, they should, for bicyclists and walkers and, and uh, transit riders and, and most anyone else that we haven't even thought of yet uh, have a right to use their streets. And so that's, that's an important piece that we feel very empowered by our citizenry across the city, across just about every perspective, believes that we should have uh, streets that are available for everyone. And so, um, you know, m many of our streets look like this, and I bet many of the streets in your town look like this as well. It could be anywhere USA, we believe, where streets were designed strictly for automobile use. And, you know, occasionally folks will want to use these streets, and more and more, as the Congresswoman said, 
folks want to use them. And so we want to start refitting these streets so that they're more friendly to everyone that's there. And as Jeff said, you know, it's really important for automobile travel as well. Uh, we found in our city that uh, the area that actually is the densest area of the city, where most concentrated employment exists, where uh, most of our cultural amenities and most of our attractions exist, actually is less congested than the suburban areas that surround us. And that's strictly because we have not only great streets, but we have a great street network woven together that gives people lots of choices and route choices and can mitigate um, a lot of traffic using the system. So you're, you're about two and a half times more likely to be congested in the outer parts of the city, the automobile-oriented part of the city, than you are in the part of the city that is uh, actually more densely populated uh, than any other part of the city. So there's a, a great benefit to automobile drivers to have a good complete street system and a network of complete streets as well. Um, and as we mentioned, the market really is tilting uh, strongly toward uh, places that are livable, walkable. Uh, even the National Association of Realtors in their survey of their market preferences found that 53% of those that they surveyed, and they survey an awful lot of people, were willing to uh, trade off the large house and the large lot and with an extra long drive for um, a smaller home, smaller lot, with, but in a walkable place and places to walk too. So it's, it's important. You'll see surveys from the National Association of Home Builders will tell you the same thing in their market surveys. And certainly, um, many people still like the big house and the big lot, and they're willing to drive further for that. And in our view, that's fine. But we, another choice out there has not been offered quite as uh, frequently, perhaps, in the past 30 or 40 years as the walkable communities. And so the market is shifting. Uh, we've, we've got lots of data that tells, tells us that that part of the market actually held up better during the recession than perhaps the suburban part of the market. So we know people want to be there, and it's, and it's a trend. And with the two biggest generations ever in our country, my generation, the baby boomers who are looking at retirement and perhaps a different lifestyle, and those that we call the millennials most definitely tell us in surveys that they're more interested in a more walkable lifestyle. It doesn't have to be the middle of a big city. It doesn't have to be Washington, D.C., although lots of people come here. Uh, it can be a small town or village, but it ne needs to have that essence of walkability. And good streets make for that essence. Um, so what did we do in Charlotte? Well, we got busy about changing about everything. We changed our policies and methods of designing streets, our guidelines we use for our capital projects. Uh, city Council design, uh, adopted new design guidelines and, uh, and changed the zoning code and subdivision code so that we got the kind of streets that will serve us better in the future, we believe. We updated our land development manual. We apply our guidelines to all areas. So in, a, in essence, we created an across-the-board change that complete streets are totally integrated into our transportation planning, design, and construction all through the organization. And so from a city perspective, what happened is that our council got very focused on design, redesigning and designing streets better. And so in the last few years, they put about $400 million into constructing uh, roads or w doing road widenings or in some cases conversions of roads to get about the business of, of creating better streets for our city. And um, so it's important for, to, for you to see of Charlotte that we have adopted complete streets as our norm, as our normal operating way of doing business. And so some of the streets that we've been able to uh, touch along there have sort of varied across the spectrum from arterials to more localized streets and small collectors and places uh, within activity centers and places in a more suburban context. And so uh, all of those have really turned out to be great. Now a lot of folks ask us about what is the cost of doing a complete street versus just a regular street for cars only. I mean, we're, we're all suffering from uh, a lack of resources to do these things and to move uh, forward uh, in our communities. Um, and so we wanted to just kind of graph that. And so what this graph does, it tells you over a period of time, the dots and the lines, the blue lines that connect those dots, will tell you uh, for a four-lane road, this is our sort of our sample, uh, and we use 11-foot lanes uh, with sidewalks and bikeways uh, as our sort of complete streets model. If you take that four-lane road uh, just in a, in a regular thing, I'm not going to make it, by the way, uh, in a regular street, it, you can kind of see the orange line there. Uh, but with 
complete streets in the yellow line, it, it adds somewhere between 25 to 8% more. And we'll admit that for a four-lane uh, kind of a road. But what the dots tell you is that variation in building roads from year to year kind of swings pretty wildly back and forth. And it's, and it's related to the availability of labor, uh, the cost of asphalt, the cost of petroleum. Petroleum drives the cost of asphalt. So uh, what you can see is the increased cost for complete streets really fits almost within the variance of what a normal street uh, construction project would be anyway. So it's just not that huge of a deal. Um, Charlotte has been nas nationally recognized uh, for its complete streets across pretty much all the professional organizations that we deal with. 2009 EPA awarded us a Smart Growth Achievement Award um, as part of our efforts with, with our Urban Street Design Guidelines. Urban Street Design Guidelines is what we called complete streets before people called things complete streets. Um, so our MPO is, has adopted a complete streets policy. And what I'm probably most proud of is our State Department of Transportation adopted a complete streets policy in North Carolina. Uh, fairly conservative and a huge highway system maintain the largest or second largest, depending on if I want to pick a fight with Texas or not, uh, of, of state-maintained highways in the country. And they adopted a complete streets policy at the board level. And then the staff, the leadership at NCDOT, got about the business of creating the practices and guidelines for, for their 14,000 employees that work for their agency. And I'm proud to say that the person, Tracy Newsom, who led our efforts um, co-chaired the group that put together the state's guidance for designing streets. And so uh, they're in the business now of driving that practice down into their organization. So uh, very quickly, why should we have a federal policy? Well, it's because we need to see the consistent application across the country of, these, of, of building safe streets uh, throughout the network of cities and towns, particularly that we're focused on. In Charlotte, roughly 55% of our thoroughfares, centerline miles, are controlled by the State Department of Transportation. And most of those are on the federal uh, aid highway system. So there's a big inventory of streets that this, the federal government should be influenced in the way they're built. In, in our experience, through our bond packages and the work that we do, about 70% of the projects that we tackle are actually on the state highway system, just because the state doesn't have the resources to come and rebuild streets in a more urban fashion. So we take that on, of course, with their permission, because they do that. So we're there. Um, some state maintained streets obviously are freeways. We're not talking about freeways here. We're talking about streets. Those streets that are those arterial types of streets that come through our major cities, that are come through our towns and villages. And in a village, it's typically the main street, frankly, of that village. And there are commercial streets where people are, where those streets typically include bus routes, bus stops. As, as Jeff mentioned, bus stops are critical in some of these Areas have bus stops that, where there is no signalized traffic, uh, there is no signalized intersection anywhere nearby. So that's important. Um, we need to look for uh, opportunities to advance the complete streets practice to the next level and prepare our cities and towns for the next generation of folks that want to come <clears throat> there. And we need to get, uh, you know, part of it is getting uh, uh, pedestrians and bicyclists across freeways. You know, we're not talking about freeways, but we're talking about getting back and forth across, and this is vitally important, and uh, oftentimes these bridges are built with little to no sidewalk or certainly no places for bikeways, and it's very uncomfortable for people to, to cross, and we feel like the, the, they're, uh, they're not, they don't feel safe, they don't feel comfortable that they're there. But you can rebuild those kinds of facilities, and we've done that in Charlotte uh, several times so that they, they work for pedestrians and bicyclists alike. And then there are the big arterial streets that are near freeway interchanges. They're usually high-speed arterials, and, and they're wide open, and they're just not uh, well-suited for pedestrians and bicyclists. But you can go back and retrofit those, as you've seen here in Charlotte, to make those actually work uh, for communities. And then there's those areas of the city that are just completely rebuilding and are responding to those market forces that want more walkability. And for us, we... Uh, are now in the transit business. We opened our first light rail line in 2007, and this has been the response. About $1.4 billion worth of redevelopment has happened in the corridor outside of the downtown area. Uh, and in response to very sensitive design that we've put into place, the transit system, the uh, willing developers who are willing to do transit-oriented development in that area. But in this particular case, that South Boulevard Street that you see was a state-maintained road. 
And they, their standards would simply not allow them to build, us to build the street or rebuild the street in a way that was more pedestrian friendly and more appropriate for the kind of development along the way, including on-street parking and some tight turn radiuses and all the elements there. So we had to take over maintenance of that street. And we've done that time and time again, transferred maintenance from the state to the city just because it didn't meet the, uh, the city's, uh, the state's standards. But, you know, lately the state has been changing, and uh, this is an example of one that is a state road that we right-sized in response to a development there of affordable housing right next to it. So in summary, our recommendations are pretty quick, and they're pretty simple, that we do need a national policy to accelerate implementing complete streets in cities, towns, and villages across the city, across the country, um, that we think that... Uh, Properly designed sidewalks and bikeways are uh, a, a huge part of that, particularly as, it, it, as they cross uh, overpasses and underpasses. Um, we believe that, you know, properly designed sidewalks are, are part of the formula along thoroughfares. And that we really need to pay attention in public transit world to those areas where folks need to cross the street. They simply need to cross the street and they have a right to cross the street. And they have a right to cross the street safely. And finally, there's lots of guidance out there, lots of national standards, lots of agencies have uh, released good standards, and we simply need to be able to tap into the greatest flexibility that those standards allow us to have across our profession. And with that, I'll just wrap it up and go Great. to the next speaker. Thanks, Danny. Sure. So doesn't that make you all want to go to Charlotte? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Um, on your briefing notice, you will see the name Lynn Peterson from uh, Washington State's Department of Transportation. Uh, late yesterday afternoon, we learned that she had to stay in Washington State, was unable to come because there was a, a special session of the le legislature um, uh, specifically on the state transportation budget. And so I think we all know what that means. And so there... Um, uh, she had to stay to um, uh, finalize the uh, the agreement with with that um, budget committee of this of the special session. So we are very very pleased that we were able to find someone at the very last minute who is actually a perfect person to have here as part of this briefing today, and that is Camille Middleholtz who is the Acting Director of the Office of Safety, Energy, and Environment uh, in the Office of Transportation Policy in the, uh, Secretary, uh, in the Secretary's Office at the Department of Transportation. And Camille leads the environmental policy team in the Secretary's Office at DOT. She has 35 years of experience working on these transportation environmental uh, issues. And so, uh, I want to say, first of all, I so deeply express my appreciation for your w being willing to come in at the last minute. Uh, but at the same time, it's really, really such an important voice that you bring to this whole discussion. So we are just delighted that you're here. Thank you very much, Camille. Thank you. Well, I'll just stay here, I think. <laughs> and I see lots of uh, colleagues that I've worked with over the years in the audience. So it's great, it's great to see you. Um, Livability, I think, is becoming increasingly important. And as mentioned, I've spent a lot of my career doing environmental work uh, and how the, how the department uh, treats environmental policies. And I think that the livability is just a wonderful outgrowth of that. We've really seen that, that people are, are very interested in, in having a lot of choice in what they do, the way they travel, and, and where they live. And, and really being able to, to travel in a more environmentally sustainable uh, way is, is important to, to people, and, and, and the department has, has, has tried to respond to, to that growing interest. Um, and really since the beginning of the Obama administration, there's, you know, there's been a, a major emphasis on livability and sustainability. And so we've been working hard to, to try and and really see that if, if you're on a, on a bike, if you're in a car, uh, if you're walking, you, 
really need to be able to travel as safely as possible, and we need we need to promote policies that are going to be supportive of that. Um, we in in two thousand and nine we actually began a partnership with the um, Environmental Protection Agency and Department of Housing and Urban Development, and uh, we just celebrated the fourth year of or the, the fourth anniversary of actually setting up the partnership. And, we, and we've worked hard over that time to, to really um, get our programs to work better. The federal programs are all set up with different authorizing uh, legislation and have, di have different goals, but to really break down the barriers between the different programs and, and see what we can do to, to have our programs work together. And, of course, especially in transportation, we work with state partners and and local partners. Most of our grant programs will go either to a state DOT or to a, to a transit agency. So we, uh, the principles of uh, the partnership are, you may have read them many times, but I, I, I thought I would just reiterate them because I think they're very important. Providing more transportation choices, promoting equitable, affordable housing, enhancing economic competitiveness, supporting existing communities, coordinating policies and levering leveraging investment, and, and valuing the communities and the neighborhoods that, that um, we're serving. So what we're trying to do is really is to help the cities become greener places. And I think it was just wonderful seeing all the exciting things going on in, in Charlotte. Um, we're also, you know, we're very pleased to really see an interest in, in bicycling as a, as a way of, 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 of traveling. But at the same time, we're also very concerned that, that um, after we've been m making some very good progress overall in transportation fatalities, we were actually seeing an increase in recent years in both the um, pedestrian fatalities and the uh, bicyclist deaths. So, so we um, obviously want to make safety a very important part of, of, um, of what we're doing. Um, I do want to mention that... Uh, we have, as one of our overall goals, the department has, has five or six goals that, that govern our strategic plan, and livability is one of those uh, goals. And under that, we have a number of performance measures, and one of them is uh, as increasing the number of states that have complete streets policies. And we've been tracking this for about three years now, and we have seen an increase. Uh, right now, we have uh, 29 states actually have... Um, policies that somehow promote uh, a complete street. Um, and then there are also now, and this is actually statistics that are uh, kept by the National Complete Streets Coalition, um, but um, there are 369 cities that have complete street policies and 37 counties and 40 metropolitan planning organizations, which are the the organizations that are responsible for, for uh, coordinating the, the, the planning in a metropolitan area for, for what federal funds will be used for transportation. We have an exciting program that, that actually came first to DOT in the um, Recovery Act. And we call it TIGER, which is Transportation Investments Generating Economic Recovery. We're just entering our fifth round of grants under that. It, it, it still has not been permanently authorized in, in one of our overall authorizing statutes, but, but we, um, we have had a, a, a series of, of annual appropriations that have continued the, the TIGER program. This is not exclusively geared towards livability, but we have been able to support quite a bit of... Um, livability um, and bicycle pedestrian types of projects. Um, I think it's 130 million that have been bicycle pedestrian projects uh, so far, this specifically. Um, and then th the other types of programs are, are oriented towards multimodal connections uh, in, in freight and multimodal connections um, for passengers. and. And so it's, it's, it's really intended to be a program that, that kind of doesn't fit neatly in, into the, the other categories of, fu of funding that, that our uh, surface transportation authorizing has. So um, stay tuned.
for the Tiger pro program, we have the, the applications just closed uh, June 3rd, and we're now very busy with our, with our reviews. Um, we were lucky enough in 2010, actually, to have a, um, a specific set aside for planning grants that helped uh, projects kind of get farther along in their, in their development and so that they were riper for, for actually receiving the funds. And uh, we worked very closely with our, our HUD and EPA partners, actually, in, in choosing cities. And we actually were able to coordinate with some of, some of the, their grants to, to, um, to make the, the grants even more effective. One example I'm familiar with, is, for example, is in um, Ransom, West Virginia, and Tar Charlestown. There actually were several different grants that were, were working together to clean up brownfields and, and do... Uh, Transportation planning and, and, and housing planning together. So, so that was that was an exciting opportunity. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't had designated funds for for um, for planning since then. But but nevertheless, we are very excited that the Tiger program is continuing in uh, in um, giving us a way to to go beyond the the funds that are available. We do have pretty good flexibility in in the federal highway programs. Uh, to, to, to fund bicycle safety and pedestrian safety projects and, and things that can better accommodate pedestrians. But, but this is a supplement, and it's really helpful. Um, finally, I, there was some mention of design standards. Um, we are also very interested in seeing better design standards. Um, the, the design standards really typically are worked through, through organizations like AASHTO and... Um, we, we think that it, it would be very helpful to have a design, a di more flexibility in design standards so that, that communities, when they're planning transportation improvements, can, can really accommodate um, designs that are, that are going to be better used by, uh, transport by, excuse me, by uh, pedestrians and bicyclists and people that are in wheelchairs and the like. Uh, so... Um, I'll close now, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, I also, in closing, I'll mention we still have year three report copies, and, and I uh, left those outside there if anyone's interested. I encourage you to help yourself. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Camille. And, um, and again, I thank you very, very much for being here, and uh, we look forward um, to your being able to answer questions and hopefully people will be able to pick up the material that you brought um, uh, later. And as you were speaking and thinking about, um, in terms of talking about design guides and and looking at what was going on in different states and localities and everything, I think that it raises again how important it is for what happens at the national level, at the federal level, to really learn and look from what is happening um, in terms of needs as well as things that are being put into place at the at the state and local level, as we heard from Danny with regard to Charlotte. And we're now going to hear more about what this really means from another kind of perspective, particularly in terms of thinking about what this means uh, for for seniors, and we are delighted that Angela Vance is here with us today. Angela is Associate D State Director for Advocacy with AARP West Virginia, and she comes from a background of working in social service and at, was a former social worker, and as a result of working in those kinds of settings and in program development, she is able to bring that to this work with regard to AARP. Uh, she spent time working in the West Virginia House of Delegates um, and also working with a variety of statewide programs for nonprofit organizations in West Virginia that were dealing with health issues like the State Alzheimer's Association. So this has allowed her to really develop a lot of relationships within the legislature as well as within the advoc advocacy community, which is very, very important as we really look at the critical needs that we see with regard to an aging population and how those special needs also fit into the needs that we see with regard to complete streets. Angela, welcome.
Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, my name is Angela Vance, and I'm um, with AARP in the state of West Virginia. So I'm here to bring you the um, older Americans' perspective and the state perspective, I hope, as it relates to this. Um, AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan membership organization. We have 37 million members across this country. Um, and to my friends um, here from West Virginia that I saw walk into the room, um, we have about 300,000 members in the Mountain State right now, so we're very proud of that as well. Um, thanks again for the invitation to participate and to share the experience that we just had um, during the last legislative session in West Virginia. Older people consistently tell us that it's important for them to be able to stay in their homes and their communities as they age. Without question, mobility is key to achieving this desire. Let's face it, it's about getting to the grocery store, going to church, getting to medical appointments, staying connected with your family and friends, um, and being able to get around your community. Nationwide, more than 8 million people over the age of 65 don't drive a car anymore, and that number is going to continue to grow, and it's growing at a very fast rate. Um, according to a recent AARP survey, two-thirds of transportation engineers and planners said that they had not yet begun to considering the design needs of older adults in their multimodal planning. We have to change this. And um, it's interesting because it sounds like so the, the generation in the middle who's doing the work right now or some of it is not taking um, the generation above them and below them in consideration when they're making these decisions. Um, so I thought that was an interesting perspective to bring. This survey does confirm that why, why this is such an important issue for communities across the country, and one of the reasons why the West Virginia legislature decided to pass the legislation to implement a statewide complete streets policy. Um, we must consider all transportation users during the planning phase of transportation construction, not after the last concrete or pavement is put down on the project. Um, we have a couple of slides that we can just look at right now. Um, I think the grass really is greener in North Carolina based on your presentation, <laughs> sir. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so one of the things that we really talked about in West Virginia when we were putting together this policy um, was that where the need exists in the community and for those communities, we need to look at that and enhance that. Obviously, this young woman could use a sidewalk, and if you can see, they've kind of created a sidewalk with the path that they have, um, that they have wore down by walking on it. Um, the next slide, okay, obviously a, a crosswalk would enhance the safety for this gentleman as he crosses the street um, and hopefully gets to a place where he can pick up some public transportation. Um, again, you can see where pit folks have created a sidewalk along this road. Um, there is a need for people to walk on this road, as evident. And um, here, so the slide before, I guess if you were in a wheelchair or a stroller, you're just out of luck. Um, and the next slide is, um, I don't know if they ran out of time or money or what was happening there. This is, this is Everyday USA, and this is very familiar to what we're seeing across the country. Um, design for transportation and infrastructure to enhance livable communities must take into consideration, as I said, strollers, wheelchairs, walkers, bikers, storefronts, traffic patterns, and traffic patterns not just for local folks who are driving every day, but we also want to think about um, tourists. Um, there's a story from West Virginia when we were working on this project um, in Fayette County, those of you who have been whitewater rafting, if you haven't, I encourage you to come visit us. Um, there was um, an interchange that was rebuilt, um, and when it was rebuilt, it knocked all the businesses out because nobody knew how to get there anymore. Um, so when you come visit us, we hope that we are making positive changes so that you can get to where you want to be and you can feed our local economies. Um, the legislation passed in West Virginia um, not only sets forth a statewide policy, but it also empowers communities to work with transportation planners to meet the needs of those individual communities. So again, we're not talking about changing every project or retrofitting everything that's going on, but it's about working with the communities to see where the need actually exists and making those changes. AARP, of course, has been working at the forefront of this issue for many years, representing older Americans to ensure that communities are livable and that everyone has the opportunity to live with dignity and purpose. 
the benefits of changing transportation policy are numerous. Roads that welcome pedestrians and bicyclists, signals for drivers to slow down. This enhances safety for those working the pedals or those driving behind the wheel. We're concerned that too many streets are hostile to those who want to walk to their destination. This is especially true in rural areas. Every two hours, a pedestrian dies in an accident on a roadway in our nation. I didn't realize that I got stuck in some of the traffic um, from the accident that occurred yesterday after I arrived into DC. Um, and an older American is <clears throat> are killed nearly twice as likely to be killed while walking than those under the age of 65. Um, the slide that you saw before that with the gentleman um, pushing the, the cart up the hill there, you know, when we talk about older individuals staying in their communities and staying connected, there's only so many times they're going to call to try to get help from a neighbor or a friend, and at some point it's going to lead to isolation. And we certainly don't want that going on. And I think the slide before that showed um, Everyday USA, the thoroughfares that you see going through. Um, I know that I was recently out of, out of town and I was at a hotel and I could see the restaurants, but I couldn't figure out how to get there. Um, and so when you have those big thoroughfares with no crosswalks and no ways to get there, you have to get in your car and you have to drive there or depend on, on somebody to do that. And then of course, um, this fella on his bike um, your pictures were a lot prettier than these are, aren't they? Um, and to give bike riders the opportunity to ride in a safe, productive way, I think is crucial. Last year, the West Virginia University Injury Control Research Center, who we collaborated with, um, and also with the West Virginia Division of Highways, reviewed 2000 to 2006 West Virginia crash reports to better understand the financial burden of motor vehicles, crashes involving pedestrians and cyclists. I don't have to tell you that you look at how many people died and that's how you change policy, unfortunately, in many instances. During the past decade, nearly 300,000, or 300, excuse me, pedestrian and cyclists died on West Virginia roadways as a result of injuries sustained in motor vehicle related traffic accidents, according to data from the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration. Between 2000 and 2006, the total human capital cost associated with these types of motor vehicle accidents on West Virginia roadways was approximately $80 million per year. These are total costs. And so um, we heard from Jeff talking about the unfortunate incident that occurred and this poor woman was charged and all these things happened. And I think the flip side that we don't often talk about is when that there's a major accident, if somebody is injured or killed, often there's property damage that's associated with that. There's cost to municipalities and EMS related cost. Um, you could be taking a, a perfectly you know, working person um, and now they're disabled um, and they are counting on taxpayer dollars for a lot. So when you think about accidents, I think it's helpful to think about it in that realm. Um, in West Virginia and across the country, people age 50 plus uh, tell AARP that they would walk, bicycle, and take public transportation more if those transportation options were safer for them to do so. Half of older non-drivers did not get out of the house on any given day, in part because they lack transportation options. And that goes back to there's just only so many times they're going to call their neighbor or their family member um, because they don't want to be a burden to folks. I'm going to go through these slides really quickly because uh, I got the warning up here and I do have a few more things to say. Um, and so this is just an example of a rural area. Um, and if you look at it, there's um, a little cluster of the signage and the driveway is very close and it's hard to see where you're supposed to go. And so just making a few minor changes can really make this intersection much more livable. You look if you separate that and you move the sign back potentially. And then the next slide, you have a crosswalk and an arrow with a turn lane that enhances pedestrian safety and safety for those traveling in their car. And then the third thing that you could do is to add some sidewalks. And so those are easy fixes that we can look at in our rural, even our rural downtown communities um, as we look to improve options. Simple policy changes at the local and state and federal level can make active living easier. In 2010, in coordination with the National Physical Activity Plan, West Virginia developed its own physical activity plan, 
with the aim to create a statewide culture that facilitates physically active lifestyles. Uh, Complete Streets was one of their recommendations um, that came out of this plan, um, and so we worked and collaborated with them as we set forth the policy. We all know that physical activity is critical to a healthy lifestyle, and public health strategy has focused intensely in recent years on the built environment or the built in community so that people have safe options to ride their bike and walk on a regular basis. West Virginia, unfortunately, has the second highest rate of physical inactivity at 35.1%, according to the research we did um, with West Virginia, West Virginia University this past year. We're the sixth highest obesity and physical inactivity related cost, and that comes in at about $208 annually per taxpayer. On the other side of this coin, we are only spending 0.6% or $1.55 per capita of federal transportation money on pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure. We're the fourth lowest in the country when it comes to this kind of spending. So we're very excited that a statewide complete streets policy is going to hopefully change some of that for us in the state of West Virginia. Complete streets designed is not the entire solution. But it is part of the solution for chronic disease associated with low levels of physical activity. It, it, I think states are starting, they're going to have to start looking at spending in a much more global way. And so one of the things that the legislation does that we created, it does create an advisory board and it brings together um, folks from the Department of Health and Human Resources um, and folks involved with physical activity that we look at those health-related costs and that we're not planning those projects in silos. Um, healthcare costs, that's not what we're here to talk about, but it's certainly a huge part of it. Um, so we're excited that everybody was sort of at the table when we started to make those decisions. In West Virginia, the Department of Transportation is responsible for 92% of the West Virginia roadways. We are one of four states um, that maintain both state and county roads along with our friends from North Carolina, Virginia, and Delaware. And as we went to implement this policy, we realized that we were the only state out of those four who didn't have a statewide complete streets policy. So that was certainly another selling point when we went to the legislature. Um, because as I told my friend, we're always competing. With, all I have to say is North Carolina does it, and I'm in, right? <laughs> Our older population in West Virginia is growing um, and has the third, we have the third highest proportion of elderly in the country at 16%. So it is time that we start to make these changes when we redesign projects um, or certainly when we build new projects. This policy change, which will become effective July the 9th, gives planners and designers more opportunity to look beyond simply thinking of streets as functional arteries for moving motor vehicles at the greatest speed possible. Our streets are building blocks or bones for creating thriving communities. Businesses do better when there's an inviting environment that encourages and invites people to walk past storefronts. We know that good street design is the fundamental to Main Street revitalization, and I think we saw that in the earlier presentation. Welcoming environments can facilitate spontaneous interaction with neighborhoods, and this is so essential for older adults who become socially isolated because these kinds of things really do lead for um, poor health outcomes for older individuals. Um, we worked with, when we sat down to work on the policy, um, of course we kind of led the charge, but we worked with a lot of groups, and I really just want to briefly mention those. Um, the American Council of Engineering Companies, the disability community, Generation Charleston and Generation West Virginia, which are our young professional groups in the state, were really key players in this movement. Their desire is to keep people in Charleston instead of going to Charlotte, which is what everybody seems to do. Um, <laughs> and so we're hopeful that these um, instituting these policies um, will keep young people. They, they want to be in towns where they can walk to and live and play all within three or four blocks. So um, we're really excited to work with them. Um, we also worked with the West Virginia Association of Counties um, because the state uh, maintains so much of the roadways that county commissions are giving out the money, but they don't seem to have any influence over the planning. And so we're hoping that that's going to make those changes as well. Again, I talked about the Healthy Lifestyles Coalition, Physical Therapy Association, Public Transit, and the Hospitality and Travel Association was another key player. As I said before, um, we want people to come to West Virginia. We want tourists in our cities, and we want them to be able to get to where they need 
to be um, and, and have a good experience so they will come back. Continuing enactment of local and state policies will begin to change this outcome, but ultimately we need to work for the support of the Safe Streets Act. I'm so excited that there's potential for a federal policy. I think it'll make a real difference. This will serve as a statement of vision for policies that provide the planning and political framework for a new paradigm of routinely using transportation investments to create streets intended to serve all users while working to institutionalize this approach in everyday work. Thank you, I really appreciate your attention this afternoon and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Ann. And I think it was a wonderful compliment to have Angela from West Virginia here with Danny in terms of Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. And I, I was also so struck by the, the basic issue here really is in terms of really thinking holistically because everybody has a reason why this is such an important thing, whether it is local businesses, doesn't matter in terms of the age, but anybody, who, as, as we were saying, who uses streets, every part of our communities has a stake in in our figuring out how to do this right. Um, and as it manifests itself in different ways in, in different places to meet all of those needs. Well, let's open it up for your questions. And if you would just identify yourself, please, that would be great. Uh, anybody have a first question or comment? Oh, okay, let's start over here first, and then we'll come to you. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, John Whitmore with the pedestrians.org. Uh, many years ago when Pat McCrory was mayor of Charlotte, he worked hard on getting sidewalks built and transit and so on, uh, and kind of grumbled about getting state DOT to, to help th make things more pedestrian friendly. Uh, now that he's governor, what's happening at the state level? Uh, well, he hasn't been governor for very long, so just the, the first few months in it. I think um, <clears throat> the General Assembly has been working pretty hard to well, do what General Assemblies do, I guess, pass the budget, uh, and, and General Assembly switch parties pretty dramatically this, this time around. So they're going about the business of, of adjusting the way they like to see government work. So uh, the governor so far hasn't had a chance to weigh in very much. He's, um, he did put on the table a new uh, funding strategy for transportation across the board. Um, generally, I think it makes a lot of sense. It, um, uses a more data-driven approach to prioritize projects. Um, but it, it is uh, largely a, a highway building project, uh, program. Um, we've been struggling a bit to get transit and bicycle pedestrian facilities brought back into it, and we've been successful to bring some of that back in, into, the, into the funding mix. But overall, it's still very heavily weighted toward the highway side. And, uh, but I do think it allocates funds uh, a little more reasonably and rationally than it has in the past, and it, it kind of recategorized how we do funding. It hasn't, um, it, it hasn't completely passed unless it happened today. Sometimes uh, I believe it will take us a while to sort through and find out exactly what it will mean to us in the city. Great. Question over here. Uh, Thanks. Uh, John from Senator Cantwell's office, and I'm losing my stuff. Um, for Angela, uh, is this um, support for complete streets something that's national with AARP or, is, or uh, for West Virginia? Um, I guess I'm curious because my own Washington delegation is looking at this issue right now. Yeah, no, absolutely. AARP across the country and here um, is supportive of the complete streets movement. Um, and we have folks here, um, if you'd like to speak with them in more detail um, after the presentation, yeah, and get you some information. That'd be great. Thanks. Terrific. Other questions? Comments? Okay. Uh, go ahead. We, go ahead. Another bite at the apple, right? Um, uh, in West Virginia, you, you, you mentioned something I experience all the time. I drive 500 miles, get to my motel, I just want to go and walk to the restaurant across the street, and, and they make me get back in my car. Um, which is, you know, as a tourist or a business traveler, that's, that's important to me. Um, have you latched on to get the 
the tourism department to talk with the Department of Transportation to make things a little more pleasant from, to get someone from the motel to the restaurant? Uh, no. In fact, I mean, as I said before, the policy actually doesn't go into effect until July the 9th. Um, but tourism is represented on the advisory council, which will be led by the Secretary of the Department of Transportation originally. Um, and so I think it's up to folks like us to make sure that this works. Um, this is our first step and our first crack at it. Um, so they are involved in that part of it. The tourism <coughs> folks are the counties, the municipalities, the health folks are a part of that. And so it's everybody working together. So, I mean, it's just incumbent on us to make sure that that advisory council is connected um, and that they are doing a good job representing everybody and that they have the ability to have influence. Um, and so I think the opportunity is there to do that with the passage of the legislation. And we just have to keep the momentum going. I was really impressed by the number of different kinds of groups that you were talking about, Angela, that had come together in terms of support of, of the state policy to, because everybody saw that they had such an important stake in this. And I just wanted to ask Danny, do you have... Uh, a sort of a, a comparable kind of coalition or in terms of thinking about the different entities that may have come together in, in Charlotte to really help support this? And and how do we, you know, and is this being replicated sort of across the country? Are people really sharing their experiences? And as we look towards, does this, you know, what makes sense nationally? Well, it's interesting. I'd say that probably the most active uh, group of street users that, that make their voice known as the bicycling mm -hmm. uh, folks. And, and, and they've, been, they've been wonderful from, from the time we started doing a, what we call a transportation action plan to urban street design guidelines. They were always there. And if there's ever a question about street design, they'll, they'll fill the, the council chamber and make their presence known. Mm -hmm. Always done very logically, politely, civil, in, in a civil way. But they certainly let their voice be known. It's really... Um, I found it difficult, and others may have a different experience, to get a coalition of walkers, mm -hmm. pedestrians. And that's kind of funny because everybody actually is a pedestrian, even if you're going from your house to your car in the garage, you're still walking there. And so everybody has to walk uh, somewhere, or, or um, they just are. But there doesn't seem to be a voice in char uh, for walkability. Um, the real estate industry is interestingly coming to this because they're seeing where the market is going, as I described in my remarks. Um, and so you're starting to see um, some interest there from folks. And then our city council is convinced. And, you know, as someone mentioned, um, unfortunately, uh, fatalities sometimes draw attention and create uh, an opinion or, or, or uh, some direction to mm -hmm. us to get about the business of creating safer streets. And we wish that wasn't the cause of doing that, but so oftentimes it is. Right. I think Angela mentioned that, too, that oftentimes it's that that ends up driving changes. And um, um, Okay, back here. Moody Star from the American Planning Association. I just have a little question about where you see the federal role in defining standards, because we heard both the need for flexibility and the need for national standards. So I'm wondering, um, I'm not sure who would be the best one to speak to this, but where you see the specific needs um, for this type of legislation? Probably everybody should respond to that. Do you want to start, Camille? Sure. Um, I think. The, the federal role, I mean, we have a lot of prescribed areas where we're supposed to be having design standards. And as I, I mentioned, uh, most of the design standards are kind of consensus standards that come from the experts. For example, the state DOTs will have experts that will participate on a committee. Um, and we've seen some progress, I think, in, in recent years in getting a little bit fresher in, in considering what we need for, for complete streets. Um, there's also something called the Manual on Uniform Control of Traffic mm -hmm. Devices. And that, um, that sets some, some, some very specific standards for, for uh, safety of not just traffic control devices, but signs and that sort of thing. Um, but those are all very important. I think where I'm understanding the the interest we have is really trying to better understand what we have and where we are out of date and trying to get up to date. 
um, but we need to do it within the constraints of 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 the uh, the federal requirements of 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 how we would would set those standards. But normally, I think the AASHTO standards, for example, they're developed by a consensus group, and then the department actually does a rulemaking that that says, okay, these are the standards now. And I think what we would be doing in the future most likely would be to have additional rulemaking that would maybe say that this range of standards could be used by cities and and um, states as they're as they're adopting their design policies. Okay, Jeff. Well, this is a this is a really meaty topic. I guess I'll try to limit myself to three basic points. Uh, one is I think we do better when we're defining when we're very clear about the goal at the federal level and trying to trying to hold people accountable to meeting goals um, and then recognize they're different and uh, allowing people to sort of figure out what's the best way to get to those goals locally. So I, I, that's one comment. The second is I think as uh, as um, uh, Danny alluded to that that there is in fact a lot of flexibility out there in current guidelines that largely goes unused and so I think there is a huge federal role in making it clear look there are there are other other uh, pieces to our design manuals than what typically gets done and so the practice becomes guidelines rather than guidelines being the guidelines so I think there's a big educating role out there just to just to widen the playing field and then you know those committees of experts uh, you know people are very expert in the thing they do uh, we have you know a long history of uh, you know some professions focusing very much on how do I get cars through here in the fastest safest way uh, you're going to get a certain result when you get those experts together and ask for guidelines. Uh, it's different than if you get all the road users who are trying to use this together and say, all right, how does all of this work together? Uh, you're going to get some different guidelines. So I think also exploring, you know, where are the places that are out of date when you start to think about all users rather than moving the maximum number of vehicles through this intersection in the time period. Uh, which is, you know, a, a potentially good traffic engineering goal, although you have places that are pretty much hollowed out downtown where the traffic level of service is fantastic. It's because no one's there and there's no ec economic activity. They're hollowed out. Traffic's working great. It's not the sign of a healthy, economically vibrant community. Angela. I think from our perspective, or I guess from the state's perspective, it, it would be so helpful to have a federal policy to look to for the guidance and everything seemed to be, you know all the you tie up all the money right and so as we look through the planning and the way the money flows we can look through those policies and if we've set up in West Virginia as an example um, all the users when we're looking at designing things and approving things and ideas for things if that trickles or if that starts from the top and begins to trickle down and that's part of the state and the county and the MPOs as all those plant as all those plans are put together, I mean, you know, one of the things that we really emphasized it's really about at the planning stage when you make those decisions. It's not it's not after the fact. We're, we you know we can't go that route. So I'm really enthusiastic that there's some movement and that we're able to be here today to talk about it. <clears throat> um, you know, the question always. When do you when do you bring the federal government in? And someone made the point, and I, I will confirm that this has been a, a ground up, bottom up movement of uh, cities and towns, then states finally coming on board, and now it's really time, I, I think, at the federal level to come on board with it. I I sort of see this as akin in some ways to civil rights. You do have the right to cross the street, you have the right to for a safe street, you have a right to walk, you have a right to ride your bike, and I think as public servants, it's incumbent upon us to make sure those rights are are upheld and protected, and so I, I think on the one level you can you can see it as just a right to access. And remembering that streets make up the vast, vast, vast majority of the public realm that's out there. Um, in some cities, it's a third of the land, a third of the real estate. In our city, it's not quite so much. But I, you know, I tease and say I'm the the largest real estate manager in the city. I manage about fifteen thousand acres of real estate with all of our street rights of way and all that sort of thing. So from a city perspective, we're, we want that to show well. We want it to show off our city well. And, um, and we think it can. But it, remember that the relationship between the, particularly the Federal Highway Administration and State Departments of Transportation is very intimate. 
and the, st the uh, states get to make up pretty much the parts of the practice that they want to do. So you have the Ashto Green Book, which, you know, it's, it, 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 it provides some breadth of practice and some, uh, uh, the ability to apply that practice in the right context, in the right scenarios. And state departments of transportation, ours in particular and others I'm aware of, will tend to narrow that guidance down to fewer choices and fewer, fewer applications. And so we'd like to see that broaden to take advantage of the full scope of flexibility and context sensitivity in those areas. I'll give you an example. We had fights with our State Department of Transportation about how do you calculate super elevation. And super elevation simply is how, how much do you bank a road to get around a curve is, is how you do that. In an urban area, generally super elevation is inappropriate. But because it's a state road and, and there is this mindset of moving traffic, you know, that, that gets designed into roads. And sometimes we say, okay, if you're going to design it in, at least design it in such a way that makes more sense for an urban area. And they won't hear anything of it. They've changed their tune quite a bit in the last four or five years, I would say. And so it's becoming much, much better. But those are the kinds of examples that we in practice wrestle with day in and day out, day in and day out. And the Federal Highway Administration basically says, well, if the state says it's okay, it's okay with us. And, it, and we know from an urban perspective, oftentimes it's just not. Um, so that's, that's kind of it. I, I could mm -hmm. go on and on about linkages between economic development and other investments the federal government puts in from an environmental perspective and a public health perspective, but we won't go there. <laughs> but, but it is really it's such an important issue, I think, in terms, of, in terms of thinking about, you know, safety, access, but also the economic activity piece which in the economic development piece is a really, really critical um, element of the whole thing, too, which it makes you wonder whether state transportation departments really understand and really look at that as, as part of the whole thing, along with Angela's points, too, in terms of thinking about public health and how that is, is also an important, an important piece, too. And, um, uh, a few months ago, we had done a briefing up here, which some of you may uh, be aware of, that was basically looking at the connection between uh, transit and real estate property values and what was happening there because there, there was that value that was really um, uh, being seen in terms of that whole access connection and everything. So um, other questions or comments? Okay, back here. Uh, this is uh, probably for Ms. Vance, uh, but uh, in areas that I'm familiar with, um, there's a great deal of effort providing housing for senior citizens and uh, uh, people of uh, uh, lesser economic means. And a lot of the planning for that seems to be done in a vacuum so that uh, housing is plunked down in various rural areas and who knows where is uh, is any of that uh, being taken care of in the uh, in the planning for the safe streets certainly it's a component of it or it absolutely should be and I think it's probably with all real estate um, I was really thrilled when I heard that the National Realtors Association um, is involved um, and looking into this because people are, are making choices about where they live. Um, I'm just thinking about the community that I live in right now, and you're absolutely right. Um, there are sort of the senior high-rise buildings that have been built in the downtown area, so there's some accessibility. Um, but to your other point, there's not accessibility in many of those areas. I think the thing that we really focused on when we were looking at this is that folks want to stay in the homes that they are currently living in. And so how do we make sure that they have those supports necessary? Or if they want to move to a community that is more accessible, that, may, that maybe is not necessarily um, senior housing as designated as senior housing. Um, but it does. I didn't talk about this in my remarks, but um, certainly accessibility to public transportation and other things would cut down on some of the... Um, the paratransit trips that are made, um, mostly within the disability community, but a lot of seniors take advantage of those 
kinds of transportation options as well. And I think one of the main reasons why the transit community in West Virginia got involved with this and was supportive of it, and we went and spoke at their conference um, last year, and they were talking about it. And frankly speaking, they can't afford to go pick everybody up in front of their door. They have got to have a way for people to get from their front door to where the bus picks them up um, or, or where the van gets them or something. So, I mean, they were sort of looking at it from that perspective on the cost of doing that. Um, so I'm not sure that entirely answers your question, but your point's well taken. Um, and that was sort of the realm of thinking when we worked the, the policy in West Virginia. And just to, to that point, I was actually in Michigan earlier this week working with the community on non-emergency medical transportation. It cost them $24 to pick someone up and give them a ride. It cost them 4 bucks for their transit. So every time you can move one trip off. I mean, and, that, and to the degree that grows, that is just going to be a budget buster. Which means people either have access or they don't ultimately as a result of that. Um, okay, one last question. Go ahead. Hal, Hal Heemstra with Balgenic. Um, I'm wondering, Angela and Danny, if you could speak to how you um, encourage the adoption of these policies when you started hearing pushback about this is just going to cost too much money, we're going to have to retrofit every road out there. Uh, on the Hill, if I understand Representative Matsui and Representative Joyce's bill um, correctly, it looks at new construction or the substantial reconstruction of existing facilities. So it's not talking about retrofitting. Can you talk about that in relation to your two examples? Yes, as I pointed out on the slide, our the incremental cost of of uh, building a street with all the components. Uh, in that particular example that I used, and it, and it varies all over the place depending on what you're doing and where you are. Um, you know, it's somewhere between two and a half and eight percent increase in the cost on a per mile basis, for example. But if you look at the cost of road building, it's it's been all over the place um, over the years, and it, it it jumps up and down. We're um, in the present environment; it costs are skyrocketing um, because of uh, cost of petroleum, cost of materials and cost of labor. Um, fortunately, our economy is returning, so that so we're competing with people that are building buildings and doing all kinds of other construction as well. But uh, I guess the point is, when you, when you look at the incremental cost of complete streets compared to the variance that's already in the marketplace, it, it just gets absorbed. It, it almost disappears. And I think you also have to look at the other side of the coin, and the other side of the coin is what value added comes back to the communities where it's there. In our particular case, we know that where we've got our best streets, we also have the strongest property values. And it's almost turning on a light switch. When you fix the street and get it right, in the right proportion compared to the built environment, the values start to take off. And, if, and then that helps us keep our tax rates low um, because you're spreading that value across the city in more areas. Um, so there's, there's the cost side, certainly, but we, we can never forget really the value-added side. And then who's to, you know, put a price tag on the safety increment that you get out of having better streets? Okay, we'll take one last question in the back. Uh, I'm Jim Cole with the Highways and Transit Subcommittee uh, here in the House. A uh, question I had kind of piggybacking on what Hal was just talking about. Um, up here on the Hill, um, the type of things Camille's office is doing um, has engendered a lot of opposition amongst uh, Republicans has um, engendered a lot of opposition among what is viewed as the, quote, traditional stakeholder community, the road builders, the contractors, and, frankly, AASHTO. Um, so when we look about talk about complete streets, we talk about practical design, we talk about some of these other pieces, contact-sensitive design, smart growth. The traditional stakeholders have always been uh, pretty skeptical, to put it mildly, and, and actively in opposition to these types of things, which they actually view as mandates. Um, very curious about the experience you had. I know in in uh, North Carolina, um, the Carolina AGC is a, a pretty powerful player, and West Virginia Road Builders, Mike's a good guy, but they've got their own interests. So I'm curious about how you dealt with that, because we're probably facing the same type of opposition here in Washington amongst the, quote, traditional stakeholder groups. Danny and Angela? Uh, 
Well, so we absolutely did encounter that, and you're right, Mike is a great guy, um, and he backed <laughs> off this year. Um, and so we worked with him last year, started to work with him. We've, we worked on this bill for a couple, three years as things go in this process. Um, and so we talked about new design. We talked about when you go to um, make changes that are already part of the planning. Um, we emphasized that it was in the budget that you currently have. Um, in West Virginia right now, we're facing huge deficits, just like every other state does, and we're looking at how um, to just sustain what we have. Um, so when we first started this project, um, we got a fiscal note from the Department of Transportation um, outlining how much it would cost to build a sidewalk on every road in the state of West Virginia. Um, and you know, that, that tends to turn people off pretty quickly. Um, and so the next year, you know, we worked with the Department of Transportation. We sat down with Mike and others. Um, we sat down with the group um, in West Virginia that's working aggressively on transportation. Um, and they, you know, they're, they're, they're influential at the Capitol. Um, and so we, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. Um, and so we started working with them. Um, and at the end of the day, um, the legislation that was passed in West Virginia sets forth the state policy. It has numerous exceptions in it. It is about new construction. It doesn't apply in the case of an emergency. I mean, so it's, we backed off a little bit, they backed off a little bit, and you know, that's how you get things done. But you're absolutely right, um, and that's what was our experience. Um, and then this year, by making those connections and sitting down and really explaining to folks, and I think just his slide presentation alone probably could convince everybody to do it. Um, and the realtors, I think, is huge to talk about where people are wanting to live. And when you're talking about the, the spreading out the tax base and the money that's coming in. So I don't know if that's helpful or not, but you're absolutely right. And so we did have to work through that very aggressively. Danny, did you want to add? Well, in our case, um, I'm not aware that um, the general contracting community has had a problem with it at all. Typically, they don't mind us raising prices a little bit of, and doing more construction work. <laughs> they, that's usually an okay thing with them. Um, you know, I, I can't help but to see the irony, though. Um, we've been through a period of, with our State Department of Transportation, if we wanted to add a wider sidewalk or bike lanes, we as a local government would have to pick up the incremental cost of doing that within our jurisdictions. However, if we were to ask for an extra turn lane or a little bit extra wide street, no problem. We can do that all day long. And that's by far the more expensive thing to do anyway. Um, and so there's a, there's a great irony involved in that sort of... Um, Sing, singular focus on street capacity and road capacity without the whole community building component of it, which I believe is what we're all kind of out to do anyway. In our particular case, uh, you know, we when we're going through this, we'd have to have a lot of long discussions with people that were representing the development industry um, for various things. And I think we, can, we, we came to a place where we had a lot of dialogue, we, we compromised, but came to a realization that we are building value. We're making the place more desirable, more vibrant as as a community. So um, we just haven't really seen a tremendous amount of pushback from that. We haven't seen pushback from our from our general assembly, which is decidedly conservative uh, in these areas. Uh, so it it feels like people are embracing this as just good common sense infrastructure building. Well, hopefully this can be the start of that and that we can find ways to, I, I think the information in the presentations and how important this has been in the examples that have been presented today, that we can get those shared and hopefully bring forth more examples in terms of thinking about the flexibility within those guidelines, how that can actually really respond to local people's needs and, and hopefully work with you in terms of thinking about what does make sense in terms of the common sense approach so that members can see how it really benefits their own communities um, and in a cost-effective, uh, very beneficial way. I wanted to ask Jeff whether you had any uh, short uh, comments that you wanted to follow up with uh, before we close out the briefing. Thank you. Just very short. I just wanted to uh, thank again the panel for joining us today and thank all of you for uh, coming out. Uh, Smart Growth America is really proud to be Part of this and to be the host for the Complete Streets Coalition and uh, to have partnered with you for this briefing. So thank you. Great. And I want to thank our presenters. You guys were terrific. Thank you all. And thank you, Camille, for 
making that heroic effort to be here with us today. And, and thank you all very, very much for being here. If you've got questions, comments, or whatever in terms of follow-up, uh, any of us are happy to try and respond to that. This is really, really an important issue. And I hope everybody will also look for the Congresswoman's bill um, and in terms of uh, the bipartisan coalition effort that she is building on this whole um, approach as well. Thank you all very, very much for coming. Thanks. Thank you.